So next up, we have a talk from uh, Peter Jones. He's going to talk about uh, open sourcing uh, sheet music. So as usual, you have uh, 15 minutes, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter, and um, I'm talking about OpenScore, and it's our mission to open source sheet music. So we were last here back at uh, FOSDEM 2017, where we announced uh, OpenScore to the world, and uh, we said that it was our, our mission was to basically do what, uh, what OpenStreetMap did for maps or Project Gutenberg did for books. We want to do for sheet music, and specifically public domain sheet music. <coughs> So uh, what does this involve for sheet music? So uh, we're basically uh, taking, uh, so initially uh, paper scores that are in the public domain and um, uh, you, uh, it's a two-step process to create open source sheet music. Firstly, you need to scan the music uh, to create bitmaps, um, but then you, you don't want to just stop with a PDF. You want something that you can um, actually interact with. We want to get musical source code. Uh, so that the next step is to convert it into um, an XML format so that you get a semantic score, something that renders with nice uh, crisp, uh, crisp lines and that you can use to render uh, audio as well so you can actually listen to the score. So the step one is covered by IMSLP, which is the, the world's largest community of um, people up um, who look for public domain scores around the world in libraries and so on and uh, scan these scores and upload them to IMSL, the IMSLP archive. And the step two is covered by the MuseScore community. So this is uh, taking those PDFs off IMSLP and transcribing them to convert, <coughs> excuse me, to convert the PDFs to XML. Uh, so MuseScore is the, um, the largest online community of sheet music creators. Um, and, of course, it's open source software under uh, uh, GPL version 2. So the idea of this is that we create digital scores, something that you can, you can actually listen to, not like a PDF, uh, that you can edit so you can change notes or extract parts, like instrumental parts, uh, transpose the score, maybe if you're a singer, so that you can reach the notes. Um, and then once you've made your changes, you want to be able to share those changes with other people without being restricted by uh, copyright. So we're trying to liberate music from copyright and liberate it from paper. And uh, so the liberation from uh, paper was covered by the XML conversion and liberation from copyright is done by publishing all of the transcriptions under Creative Commons Zero. Uh, so there's, uh, they're effectively fast-tracked into the public domain, so there's complete freedom to, uh, to adapt them and share them. So um, in preparation, so we, we announced the project uh, FOSDEM 2017, and um, at that point we had run uh, two, uh, or one at that time, pilot transcription to do the Tchaikovsky's uh, Sixth Symphony, and then shortly afterwards we did another uh, to transcribe Foray's Requiem. So the method was that we would take an IMSLP PDF and we'd basically break it up into chunks of a few pages, send them out to MuseScore users who would transcribe these pages, um, and then we would check them and uh, if they, to see whether they were accurate with the original, and if not, then we'd request improvements, send them back, and then once they were all finished, we'd join them together uh, to create a finished score. And the, the result of this was that um, we, we reckoned we could do, it would take about a month to fully transcribe a, a symphony using this method. But of course, you could uh, run multiple in parallel to speed things up. And um, the hope is that um, while it was initially, uh, well, myself doing the checking of all of these, that we would be able to invite more uh, experienced transcribers to, to take some of the review burden um, and then um, it would be up to me to do a final review um, before publishing it on the OpenScore account. So we then uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign in June of 2017 and called OpenScore Join the Sheet Music Revolution. And the pitch of the campaign 
was that um, we would liberate an initial 100 works uh, using uh, the, the tools that we currently had available at the time. Um, and uh, so this was like a concrete goal um, that we had. And then the sort of the more abstract aim of the project as well um, was that by backing this project, you'd also be helping enable it to grow in the future. So we would use this 100 works as like um, a, a trial at scale to try and establish the best procedures uh, for doing the transcriptions to solve any scalability issues, develop the required automation tools to enable it to grow in the future to eventually liberate uh, all public domain music. So how it worked um, was uh, we appealed to, to MuseScore users that if you um, give us your time in transcribing the scores, uh, then we'll reward you with um, a pro membership of MuseScore's uh, share, a music sharing website. And the, the Kickstarter backers is that if you help us um, back, if you help the project by contributing money, uh, this will enable us to, to run the transcription effort and to make those uh, scalability improvements. And the, the backers would get rewarded by, they would have, uh, a, their name would appear in the credits and there were perks that they could pay. Um, if they paid a certain amount of money, then they would get to choose an edition that we would actually digitize one of those 100. Uh, or they could... Um, and if they paid a, a bit more, then they could actually write a dedication in the public edition. So you could be the person to, to have a dedication in the public version of um, Beethoven's Fifth, for example. And as a bonus, each um, of these 100 editions would get a, uh, a visualization made by the digital artist uh, Nicolas Rougeau, um, who had been uh, visualizing... Uh, Muse score, uh, scores from musescore.com before this, and here's a visualization of his, um, of Vivaldi's Four Seasons that he created. Uh, so he offered to create a visualization of each of the open score um, uh, transcriptions. So, uh, so we ran the campaign, and um, uh, that uh, it lasted a month. We uh, exceeded our goal of uh, 45,000 euros. We managed to raise uh, 51,000. And over a thousand people backed the campaign, and hundreds of people, uh, MuseScore users, um, told us that they were interested in transcribing. So then the transcription work began straight away. And the way this would work is I would open a transcription group on MuseScore.com and invite a bunch of transcribers and give them each sort of three to five pages of music. They'd upload their transcriptions, and then I would check them. So the early challenges that we faced is the variety of pieces chosen by the Kickstarter backers. These range from piano scores to entire symphonies. Um, and the, the length of the pieces, there are many scores with over uh, more than like 10 instruments or 50 plus pages of music. Um, and of course, many of the transcribers were inexperienced and they saw OpenScore as a learning tool that uh, they would do a transcription and then we would give them feedback on it. But of course, this is all basically what we're expecting and we, we even encouraged um, uh, we wanted to get the, uh, uh, the well-known works, so we, we were hoping to get uh, the longer works. And, um, and the way to, uh, to help those inexperienced transcribers is I published um, a set of uh, online exercises uh, that they could complete before they started doing the transcriptions. So this would show them, uh, they would see, uh, it's basically instructions of if you see this in the original score, uh, here is how we would like you to notate that in Muse score. So it's like a step-by-step -step guide. And we'd also help them by producing a template score. So we would add uh, all the instruments um, to a Muse score file and set it up uh, all ready to go so that they could just start uh, adding notes from the beginning. Um, and the, the rule for the template score is it has to contain all the instruments from all the movements, and this is important uh, when it comes to joining them up later. And this is the first challenge, is joining uh, all of those scores together. And we were relying on a MuseScore 2 feature to do this called the Albums feature, which was an experimental feature. And uh, there are various issues um, 
with this feature. So eventually uh, it became necessary for uh, me to write a, a separate program in Python that would take uh, scores and uh, join them together outside of MuseScore so that we could preserve as much information as possible. Otherwise, um, some of the, um, the transcriber's work would be lost. Uh, so then we would give the join score to... Um, uh, so, but the point of this is that even after the transcription is complete, there's still a significant amount of work that goes into tidying it up before it's actually ready to be published. Another challenge is the variety of notations. So um, what we were hoping is that we could sort of gradually speed up over time. So we were starting out with that initial one um, uh, transcription being completed per month, one of these symphonies. But... Um, it, it actually it was very difficult to speed up because we found that each new score would contain sort of new notation quirks that we, we hadn't encountered before, the transcribers wouldn't have seen. So we weren't sort of learning over time in, in the way that we hoped we would. So I was learning, but there'd be new transcribers and they wouldn't be gaining this experience and each new score posed new challenges. So the solution to this... Um, was to actually, in each template score, um, I would add um, uh, s specific instructions for that score. So I would go through the, um, the IMSLP score and look for things that I thought the transcribers might struggle with, and then um, I would add instructions about those things to the score itself. Uh, so this made work easier for transcribers. It made work significantly easier after the transcription was complete, but it created a huge burden in studying those scores before the transcription could even begin. And in the extreme case, um, we have uh, Wagner's uh, Die Valkyrie here, um, which is the, the opera um, that contains the Riders of Valkyries. And uh, so you can see the template score for this uh, has 114 different instruments, and that's because... Um, so what you're seeing here on the left is like a zoomed-in version, and on the right you can see that line indicating that's how much you're looking at. So all of that down on the right-hand side of the screen, that's more instruments. So you're only seeing like the, um, uh, the wind section at the top, and there's still the, the brass below that, and then the percussion and the strings and so on. And this is due to the requirement to have every instrument that's in every movement. And so there's instruments here uh, like clarinets in A um, and clarinets in, in B flat and so on. There's all the, all the different keys. And the score itself is over 700 uh, pages long. Um, so this poses a significant challenge. And um, so because of the burden of creating these templates, um, it um, meant that we needed to adopt a new approach. Uh, so, um, about this time, we were approached by um, uh, Mark Gotham from the University of Cambridge, who had funding to run a project to digitize uh, 19th century songs um, for uh, piano and, uh, and a singer. Uh, but we, we didn't think we'd help him because we were struggling with our, with our own project. But um, I had another look at it, and I thought, well, perhaps actually we can help here, because these pieces that Mark wanted to transcribe were, were much shorter. There's two to three pages each, so there's no need to split the score up and rejoin it later on. So we just have one transcription group for all of the pieces, rather than one group for each piece. Um, there's only two instruments in each score, and they're always the same instrument, so we just have one template that would work for every single one of these pieces. Um, and... Um, they're all based on a common theme, so the notation was similar. And what this meant is that it was actually possible to get more people on board with the viewing, uh, with the reviewing, whereas before it had to all be done by me because of all the specialist notation. So this allowed us to complete 250 of those um, shorter transcriptions in four months, which is kind of what we were hoping for. So with the main project and running out of time, so I'm speeding up, uh, we, had, um, we switched to doing transcriptions by individuals. And um, so rather than a group, it would be one person would be the transcriber. Um, but this means that you, the transcriptions run in series rather than in parallel. So one person working their way through the score. So it takes significantly longer, but of course you can still do more than one at a time. 
And uh, so just recently, 24th of December, MuseScore 3 was released, and this has um, important features that enable us to, to uh, go faster in the future. So it has automatic layout, which means that um, the, the task of tidying up a transcription that's been finished is much quicker. And it also has a score comparison tool, which means that we can get printed out a list of if somebody edits a score, we can see exactly what they change, and this protects the integrity of the scores. And uh, so we have the, uh, the planets here, which um, even though the transcribers had done this on their own after the, the point at which it was given to us, we had to keep sending it back to them to get it ready for publication, and this took several months, um, even though it was already finished, but now we estimate that would take two to three weeks in music or three. And I have uh, a preview of the completed score here. So you see the couple of visualization, and um, we can uh, listen to the, the playback on the score page on musical.com, where you can't hear the playback. Okay, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, <laughs> but the time is up. We're actually over time already. So I would like to ask for a warm thank you for the talk. Presentations at FOSDEM last for 15 minutes. I had a lot to say, and unfortunately at this point I ran out of time. But thanks to the magic of video editing, I'm able to include the final two slides for you now. In the last few weeks, we launched a new sub-project called OpenScore Braille, the aim of which is to improve the conversion of music XML to Braille for the benefit of blind musicians. The OpenScore Braille project is being run by Mike Nelson, who's a long-time MuseScore contributor on the forums, and who also contributed the open score transcription of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. Mike also keeps many scores on his personal MuseScore account, and he's received a number of requests over the years from blind users who are looking for clean XML that would convert well to Braille. One of the main problems with Braille conversion at the moment is the presence of invisible symbols in the XML file, which were added for playback purposes, but which were not actually present in the composer's original score. This can be things like additional tempo markings or staccato markings. And since these were not in the original score, they're made invisible in the XML. Uh, but unfortunately, they do show up in the Braille. So blind musicians reading the Braille file will come across notation that's not really supposed to be there. So what Mike does is he goes through the scores and removes this invisible notation, and he also fixes various other problems, um, and he keeps a list of the issues on the MuseScore issue tracker, with the aim being to get these problems solved in the software rather than requiring separate files for blind and non-blind users. But in the meantime, Mike works on individual scores as requested by blind users, and they can make requests at musecore.com slash groups slash openscore dash braille. So this is a group where blind musicians can get together to discuss the issues facing braille conversion and to request particular scores made available in a braille-friendly XML format. Now, it's currently up to the blind users to do the actual conversion to Braille themselves. Uh, this is something that we want to be able to provide in the future. But in the meantime, they can find that there's many Braille scores available at the website braillearch.org, which is run by a MuseScore user from China called Hu Haipeng. So that's it from the OpenScore presentation at FOSDEM 2019. Make sure you subscribe for more videos and also check out our social media accounts on Facebook and Twitter where we push out an update every time a new edition is released. Thanks for watching.